Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Srinath. I'm from the Degatna's lab here at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I'm, I'm always being interested in this idea that you can actually predict a particular phenotype of interest just based on the DNA, specific types of DNA sequence that you have in different genomes. And that interest of mine just led me to my talk today, which is I'm going to be talking to you about the identification of certain monosterial virulence factors associated with adaptation to coffee plants. So I'm just going to start by giving you a bit, bit brief background on Pseudomonasiremia, which is a bacterial pathogen that causes disease in more than 100 crop and non-crop species. And then what David usually writes on the grants is that the reason that he wants to study this is that by understanding how the system works, uh, we might be able to prevent crop loss in the future. But to be honest, I'm just interested about trying to figure out how stuff works. Uh, <clears throat> And then as we started to uh, build knowledge about this system, we realized that uh, plants are actually pretty good at defending themselves against this type of pathogen. And they do that uh, through the identification of pathogen-associated associated molecular patterns, or that is also called PEMS. And then once this detection occurs, this leads to uh, a immune response that is called the pem triggered immune immunity, or PTI. And the cheering of that immune response then prevents uh, pathogen growth, and then the plants remain healthy. But Pseudomonas yungae then gets its name from this remarkable apparatus that Pseudomonas yungae has that is very analogous to uh, syringe, which he, uh, the pathogen uses to deliver these virulence factors directly into the cell of the of this plant. And then these virulence factors are called type 3 secreted factors. And then you can imagine that, that once these effectors are there, they target this protein, proteins involved in immunity, and then prevent PTI from being activated. And once this happens, then the pathogen can grow and end up causing disease. <clears throat> so then you can imagine that different types of plants have different types of immune components, and then these different types of immune components require different effectors uh, to be suppressed. <clears throat> So then this model then suggests that pseudomonas hearing is either like a very uh, generalist pathogen, where single isolates can infect a number of different hosts at the same time, or that pseudomonas hearing isolates are actually very specific, where single isolates can, uh, uh, can infect uh, specific kinds of hosts, and then these isolates, uh, when you compare these isolates, you should see a high level of variation in the genome level. And by looking at the core genome analysis, uh, car genome phylogeny of 504 Pseudomonas syringe isolates that we have in our data set, uh, we see that the, the second case uh, seems to be true, even that we see a high amount of variation uh, among these isolates. And then, in fact, the variation is so high that these isolates were divided in 13 different phylogenetic groups that we also refer to as phylogroups. And interesting for us, uh, uh, isolates that uh, cause this in the same host are not necessarily closely related. So I'm showing here at the top is just, for example, uh, coffee plants belong to the Rubiaceae family. And then uh, I'm showing uh, these coffee plants over here as well in this color of yellow. So we have, for example, coffee pathogens that cause, the, uh, uh, pathogens that cause disease in, in coffee on phy uh, phylogroup 4 here in orange, phylogroup 11 here in brown, and now here on phylogroup 3, which is shown in green. So for the remaining of this talk, I'm going to ask you to remember these colors. Pilot group 3 is green, pilot group 4 is orange, pilot group 11 is brown, and the coffee uh, uh, host that you wish to sit on uh, has this yellow color on the outer circle. So based on this, we know that uh, uh, these coffee isolates come from three different lineages. So the first question that I'm going to be addressing today is, uh, do these three different lineages in fact coffee using the same strategy, or do they have different strategies that they evolve to cause disease in this host. The second one is going to be what are the types of factors that are involved in each one of these strategies and at the end uh, how these types of factors are involved in the first place. So going for the first question, um, what we, we did here is just predict all the factors for all the isolates that we have and all we're doing here is clustering isolates that have similar effector profiles together. So again I'm just showing effector families here at the top, isolates here at the left, and then we're just closing them in a pairwise manner according uh, to the, the way that their profiles show. And the results for that analysis are showing here. And then we can see right away is that isolates from similar genetic backgrounds, they tend to have a similar uh, type 3 effective profile. But what is interesting for us is that our coffee isolates here, <coughs> on phylogroup 3, are actually 
more have a profile more similar to the ones in file group four than to the rest of file group three, that group over here. So it seems like you have one strategy here that both of these bugs employ that seems to be quite similar to each other. Uh, but in contrast, uh, we have our other group of cough pathogens over here. It's, they seem to have a, a profile very different from the ones we see over here. And in fact, when we look at the number of type 3 effects that each one of these isolates have, uh, we see that uh, these, effect, these isolates hardly have any effectors at all, which would suggest they then infect uh, coffee plants using some other strategy that does not uh, make use of type 3 effectors. So for the ones that do use type 3 effectors to cause disease, we then go to a second question where we try to identify effectors that are specific to, to coffee. And all we're doing here is performing a Fisher association test uh, with a Fisher test, which is just for every family that we have, we calculate the distribution of presence and absence of these genes in two groups, uh, coffee pathogens and non-coffee pathogens. And any uh, association that is significant, we want to know about it. So I'm going to walk you through this figure, since uh, the first time that people see this is a little bit confusing. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the number of significant factors that we found on our association tests. So here, if you sum up all the numbers, you should have the total number of factors that we found to be associated. And what I'm doing here is grouping each one of these factors in different categories, according to categories that I created uh, beforehand. So for example, if we look at our uh, genome phylogeny again, what I mean by coffee groups on phyla group 11 are only the brown ones that are, are from the yellow coffee plants. Uh, the phyla group 11 then is gonna have, the, are gonna be the brown that don't have any uh, yellow here at, the, at this particular outer circle. And similarly, the phyla group three isolates that are from coffee are these ones that have yellow, and then the group that is only shown as phyla group three are all of the, these ones that don't have this yellow, uh, without this yellow isolate. And the same thing holds true for the phyla group four, one, where we have phyla group four coffee and the rest of phyla group four that is not coffee. So then the categorization of this will be like this. So I'm showing one example that falls into this category of being present only on phyla group three. And then I'm, I'm, I'm showing here the isolates that have that particular effector with these blue circles. So we can see that I'm, uh, to consider one of these factors part of this group, I'm, 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 sure, uh, I'm requiring it to this factor to be present in more than 50% of isolates in that particular group. So we can, if we look at the phyla group three, there are more than 50% of these strains over here on the green that have that blue dot. But there are none strains here on the coffee isolates that have that strain, of the half at that effect. And for, so we, we, you, you, you mark phyla group three over here, and for the coffee phyla group three, it's just empty. And the same thing for the phyla group four, there are no coffee isolates here having that gene, and then there is less than 50% of, of the rest of phyla group four isolates that have that gene. So we just mark an empty circle for both of them. And then there is nothing going on in phyla group 11, we do the same. <clears throat> Uh, now I'm showing an example uh, for this particular bar where we have uh, these effectors associated, uh, ca categorized into coffee from phyla group three and coffee from phyla group four. So we take, if we take a look at those groups, we see that our coffee from phyla group three all have that particular effector. Our coffee from phyla group four also have that particular effector. But uh, less than 50% of the ones on phyla group three and less than 50% of the ones on phyla group four have those effectors. So we put an empty circle for both of them. So for this analysis, then I'm requiring that uh, significant effectors must be present on at least these two groups. They are the groups of interest uh, for us here today. And then these are the ones that I'm showing in the green bars. So by doing this additional filter, we are left with eight type, type two effectors that we seem to be uh, strongly associated with adaptation to coffee plants. So then this is the clustering analysis that I showed you before with the profile of type three effectors. And the only way in which uh, this particular configuration could have happened is that if, is that if both of these lineages from phyla group three coffee isolates and phyla group four coffee isolates evolve their effector independently from each other, or the second one is that one lineage actually evolved that first and then transferred over to the other lineage, and that's why you see that pattern. So I decided to check for the second pattern first, and what we can see here, all, of, all of that I'm doing here is just aligning the genomes from our coffee isolates from phyla group three against the genomes from our coffee isolates from phyla group four. 
And the idea behind this is that uh, if that transfer really happened, we should see conserved DNA regions that harbor type 3 factors that are uh, of interest to us. So I'm showing the results of this analysis over here, where the green ideograms here represent contexts that have any DNA stretch that is identical to oh, oh, contexts on phylogroup group, coffee isolates from phylogroup group 3, that have any DNA stretch that is identical to, coffee, uh, to the context of coffee isolates from phylogroup group 4. <coughs> and even though I'm representing only one genome, coffee genome here and one coffee genome here, all of them show this exactly same pattern. So over here with black arcs, I'm showing the conserved regions across these two genomes. <clears throat> and then uh, what I'm showing here, we can see right away, is that we have a 40 KB region that is shared between these groups, and that they're exactly the same. They're 100% identical. When we map our type 3 effectors into this region, and if all of these contexts, we see that we have six effectors that are present on that particular region. Uh, and then, interestingly enough for us, Five out of six of these effectors are the ones that we identified before are being strongly associated with coffee plants. And the only exception being this last effector called HOP-D1. And in addition, when we look at the coverage deaths of each one of these contexts, we see that these contexts that have the effectors seem to have very high coverages in comparison to the other contexts that are uh, expected to be from the chromosome. So we think that these contexts are actually part of a plasma. So today I just showed you that uh, in regard to coffee plants, we have two strategies that isolate seems to use. One that in fact uh, uses type 3 factors and the other one that doesn't. And then the second one, we, based on our uh, analysis of association, we could find eight factors that seem to be strongly associated with coffee. And our evolutionary analysis suggests then that we were, uh, that one lineage evolved those effectors first and then transfer uh, a plasma to some other lineage that wasn't an actual pathogen uh, of coffee. And then by getting this new plasma, this lineage became able to infect coffee as well. Well, yeah, and then this work was brought to you by the Guckman Lab. Um, and I would like to thank all the, uh, the, the lab members that helped me up with this presentation. Um, then also our collaborators in Brazil that uh, gave us access to all the coffee isolates that I talked about here today. And thank you very much for listening, and I'll take any questions.